Hello, and a warm welcome to the inaugural BQuit tutorial day. Um, my name is Paul Skriptic, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Bristol and one of the organizers of this workshop. So we started organizing the workshop many months ago now um, via Microsoft Teams, um, and it was clear that this was going to be a, a virtual uh, conference this year again, unfortunately. Um, and we were keen that we would like to make BQuit uh, as you know better than ever, if we could. Uh, we know that BQuit's always been popular with, with early career researchers, and we were aware, given the, the, the virtual nature of the workshop, that we were going to have many more attendees than in a, a normal year when we were hosting in person. And so we thought that this year uh, would be a fantastic year to introduce a tutorial session uh, to BQuit. So as we all know, uh, the field of uh, quantum science and technology uh, continues to grow, uh, and it's definitely showing no signs of slowing down. Um, the interdisciplinary nature of the field uh, means it really contains a, a, a wide range of topics, from physics to computer science to maths to engineering uh, and, and far beyond. And, and it's really a real challenge uh, to keep abreast of all of the different uh, topics and subfields that, that are contained. Um, and at BQuit, we've always aimed uh, to attract uh, researchers from across the field, and we've always aimed to have a, a very broad uh, program uh, each year. Um, and so we felt that it would really be a great idea to put together a tutorial day this year um, to try and give a bit of background and a bit of context uh, to the workshop and to try and help you all uh, get the most out of, out of the talks, which will start uh, on Monday. Uh, so I'm really, really delighted uh, with the program that we have for you today. Uh, I can honestly say that we we really couldn't be happier with the with the speakers that we've uh, that have kindly agreed uh, to give us the tutorials. Um, you know, preparing a tutorial uh, and giving it is is really no small ask, um, especially in this online format. And so uh, it, I'm really grateful, and I want to extend a, a massive thank you uh, to our speakers for agreeing uh, to take part today. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to the to the set of talks, uh, and I know the rest of the organising committee are too, and and we'll all be keenly watching uh, to see what we can learn. Um, so I'll just give you a, a quick overview just of the the three speakers we have. Um, so I think it's for me it's really hard to believe that it's already been 30 years. Uh, since Professor Arthur Eckhart uh, published his celebrated paper, uh, the, one of the founding papers of the field of quantum cryptography. Um, this was the first paper to use quantum entanglement to do quantum cryptography. Uh, and moreover, it was the first paper to realize the practical application of quantum non-locality for cryptography. So we're really honored uh, that Professor Eckhart agreed uh, to give us our first tutorial today uh, on quantum cryptography. Um, so the field of integrated quantum photonics uh, is a relatively new uh, compared to many of the other well-established platforms in quantum information science and technology. Um, for example, the first quantum logic gate in this platform was only realized it in 2008. Um, but despite its relative youth, uh, this technology has really been developing a, a record pace uh, and really provides a route to large-scale quantum information processing with hundreds and thousands or beyond number of photons. So this is really a very, very exciting uh, platform. Um, so Fabio Chirino and his group in Rome are really one of the world leaders in this technology and they're responsible for driving you know, this rapid progress. And so again, we're really, really delighted that uh, Professor Chirino uh, has agreed to be our second speaker and will give us a, a tutorial on integrated quantum photonics um, this afternoon. And then finally, uh, it's now been 20 years uh, since Professor Robert Rausendorf, uh, in collaboration with Hans Briegel, introduced a, a really fascinating model of quantum computation, uh, known as the measurement-based model of quantum computing. Uh, and rather than preparing a product state, like in the usual model, and then applying a sequence of gates, uh, in this model, you prepare a large entangled state, and then the computation proceeds by a measurement. So it's really a, a very interesting and very relevant model of quantum computation. And so finally, we're delighted that our final speaker of today will be Professor Robert Rausendorf, who will give us yeah, this a tutorial on this on this great topic. Um, so I hope you'll agree uh, this looks uh, this was going to be a great program, and I'm, I'm really excited about uh, how today will progress. So we would encourage you to ask questions during these tutorials. Um, there's a Q&A box along the side of the screen, um, and each session is being chaired, and the chairperson will, will feed questions up to the speaker at, at appropriate points. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to have a bit of interaction uh, as and when we can. Um, moreover, when there are breaks, um, we have a, a virtual networking lounge, um, something called Gather Town, um, which we hope is as kind of as close as possible uh, to a real conference venue. So we know that online conference is no uh, replacement for a real one, uh, but we wanted to give you some opportunity to have those kind of 
more uh, organic interactions and so we invite you all to try and come along to to this networking lounge which you'll find in the in the menu on the left hand side uh, and there's a chance for you to chat using your cameras if you want uh, with with other participants and this will be not just for today but for the whole conference and so we hope to see uh, lots of you there um, so at BeQuit, we've we've always prided ourselves that this is a very uh, welcoming uh, and inclusive workshop. Um, and so I would just like to encourage everyone uh, to have a read of our code of conduct, uh, which can be found at the back of the program, uh, just to, to help us make sure that this is really a, a very welcoming uh, conference to be at. Um, so every year at BeQuit, we, we like to give out merchandise to our attendees. Um, so I still have my uh, 2008, uh, 2019, sorry, uh, pint glass, uh, which I got a couple of years ago. Um, and it's looking a bit worn around the edges, but it is still going strong. And so this year, with the conference being online and with having attendees from all over the world, and I think we, we checked last night, and I think in, in the end, it's 48 countries uh, we have attendees from. So it really wouldn't have been feasible or environmentally friendly uh, to send you all merchandise. Um, however, we were we were keen to give you some uh, digital merchandise nonetheless. And in particular, uh, what we are able to do is to share with you a, a really fantastic and, and very moving documentary uh, called Picturing a Scientist. Um, and it really is a must watch, in my opinion, and I can and I can highly recommend it. Um, so this isn't yet freely available to view online, um, but you there are instructions for how you can access it uh, in the program. And so I hope you'll all take the opportunity to, to watch this at some point. It, it really is worth it. Um, so if you have any questions about anything, uh, then please get in touch with one of the team. Uh, you can either send us an email or you can uh, go by the website or you can find us in the in the lounge. Um, we're here to help and we, we want to try and make this a, a, a great workshop. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm, I'm really happy and I, I would like to hope that you all really enjoyed today and I hope you find it a really useful and, and exciting day. And so without further ado, I would like to pass over to, to our first chair, uh, which is Dr. Jorge Barato, uh, and then he will uh, introduce the, the first speaker for today's event. Good Hi, morning, Jorge. everyone. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this first session of the Tutorial Day of Bristol Quantum Information Technologies Workshop 2021. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Jorge Barreto, and I'll be chairing this first session. Uh, and our story today starts uh, a few years ago specifically about 30 years ago, in 1991, with uh, a paper in PRL, uh, Physics Review Letters, published uh, by our speaker today, Arthur Record. And this paper, as Paul said, sets the uh, foundations for quantum cryptography uh, based uh, on, th that has eventually evolved in today's multiple technologies and uh, also science and fundamental questions uh, around the, the, the nature of the universe. So uh, what else can we say? Well, I, I think I think something particularly remarkable about this paper is that only one year after this publication, uh, a similar summary was, was published in Scientific American. So it, it went very quickly from science to actually outreach. Uh, and, and I think that's pretty remarkable. In any case, this was, uh, I would say, the culmination of Professor Eckert's uh, uh, PhD work at Oxford. He's also been um, at uh, Cambridge and UCL and is currently a professor of quantum physics at the Mathematical Institute at Oxford and also the director of the Center for Quantum Technologies and Lee Kong Chan, uh, centennial professor at the National University of Singapore. So without further ado, uh, Professor Arthur Eckert, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and for this uh, kind introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I actually, you know, I honestly, I feel um, almost like a dinosaur in this field. And it's just, uh, we are talking about 30 years ago. It was a completely different sort of atmosphere at the time. And, uh, and it was not entirely clear whether this field will take off in any way. Well, anyway, so um, Good morning to you in Europe. I'm I'm in Singapore at the moment, so it's just uh, late afternoon on my side. Um, my plan, uh, what I would like to do in this talk is um, just to introduce the basic concept of of, of quantum crypto, um, and uh, perhaps give you some sort of a, a feeling how it works, why it works, and uh, also. Um, 
where is it going? So it's, it's, it's you know it's it's quite interesting fusion of uh, of quantum physics and uh, um, cryptography, seemingly two different things, right? And at some point, this this uh, um, fusion um, sort of um, became like. Uh, almost natural right so so it's, it, it looked like you know quantum physics was designed to help cryptography um, and so i would like um, to share these you know my perspective on this so the um the outline of my talk is um roughly I, it may change you know I, i'm very i'm very open to any question at any time and, and I'm, I'm quite willing actually to go in any other direction in this tutorial but uh, this is the basic idea so i would like to um, tell you a little bit about the history of secure communication um, and uh, the question people's been asking over time so is there such a thing like a perfect cipher is there a way to communicate with perfect security uh, then i will identify the key ingredient for this to happen so that's uh, that's something called the key distribution a cryptographic key i'll define what cryptographic key is and we'll tell you why is it that uh, this key distribution is like the holy grail of uh, secure communication. And then, of course, we'll just bring quantum physics to this. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I may just go ballistic and talk a little bit about some crazy ideas. But uh, so, so that's the plan. So let's see how it goes. So let's let's start with uh, a bit of history. It's 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 interesting. Uh, it's it's all about uh, human attempts to communicate with uh, security, uh, and uh, we we have all reasons to believe that it all started as soon as people um, came up uh, with uh, uh, writing, especially with alphabet. When you have a finite set of characters, then you can you can do all kinds of things with them. So you can permute them, you can substitute one character for another character, and you can do both. So it's kind of interesting that indeed it was in the Mediterranean area, where mostly due to Phoenicians who came up with the notion of the alphabet or invented the alphabet, that then the Greeks and the Romans uh, took over and, and, and play with this alphabet. So that's that was the area where, geographical area where, um, cryptography was really developed. In contrast, when you look at China, for example, where you don't have a set of basic characters, but you have a, you know, there's just a, a great number of the Chinese characters, it was much more difficult to design such basic techniques. And uh, they, um, they didn't come, well, the Chinese didn't quite use the, 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 the same set of techniques, obviously, they, they were they were usually hiding the messages or, or trying to uh, conceal them in some other ways. So, 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 so it's clear, I think, to most historians that the invention of the alphabet was uh, absolutely important for uh, the evolution of some basic techniques in, in cryptography. So just to give you uh, two examples, perhaps, uh, the, the oldest device that we know that was used for secure communication it was a, a Greek uh, invention called skittily so that was used about 400 bc in ancient sparta and what this device is essentially it is like a wooden button of a certain diameter and imagine that you have two guys say two military commanders in ancient sparta so one would just take a piece of parchment would wrap it around this wooden button and uh, write the message uh, lengthwise of course, that will be in ancient Greek. Uh, and then uh, what uh, the, the, the sender would just unwrap the parchment and give the parchment itself to a courier who would just take the parchment from one location to another. And uh, the other location, the receiver of the message, would have a wooden button of the same shape, of the same diameter. So the guy would just take the parchment, wrap it around, and the message would just... Uh, reappear so you know it's it's a very simple but it's the first device that we know for actually for permutation of characters the first mechanical device um, for implementing permutation for the purpose of uh, secure communication another idea is uh, attributed to julius caesar so allegedly julius caesar used uh, 
the substitution cipher. So for each letter of the Roman alphabet uh, in his secret correspondence, he would use uh, another letter from the Roman alphabet. And the, the usual rule, the most common rule, so historians tell us at least, was to shift the alphabet by three characters. So when you do this, you can see on, on this transparency here that um, you have uh, the letters from the Roman alphabet here, and then you just shift those letters by three to the left and append A, B, C to uh, at the end of the string. So then you, it just gives you the substitution rule. It says for A, substitute D, for B, substitute E, for C, substitute F, and so on and so forth. So then you just take a message and use this rule uh, to generate a cryptogram. So that, that, that happened later, about 50 BC uh, in ancient Rome. Now, as you can easily guess, you know, those ciphers were far from being secure in any way, right? And, um, and the, 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 the people came up with all kinds of methods to break them, but I think uh, probably the most important one was a systematic method of breaking uh, substitution ciphers that was proposed by Al-Kindi, um, who worked in what is today Baghdad um, in the in the ninth century. So Al-Kindi, I mean, he was he was a polymath. He was doing just about everything. Yeah. There was a golden period of uh, uh, Islamic civilization at the time, uh, and you know, if at the time, if you wanted to learn anything, you would just travel to Baghdad. Um, so Al-Kindi came up uh, with uh, a beautiful solution to um, breaking substitution ciphers. Uh, not only just simple ciphers like uh, you know, Caesar cipher where there was a shift by two, but any substitution cipher. So Al-Kindi figured out that when we write and when we use a natural language, um, the, the uh, characters are not completely random, right? So it's not like um, that we put a, on paper a random set of characters. The natural language has a certain pattern. Some characters are more common than, than other. For example, in English, or in fact, most in the European languages, the letter E is the most common one. Then it's just, uh, in, in English, it's, it's followed by the letter T and letter A, and uh, we know that uh, some combinations of letters is, is, is actually more common than other, like th appears uh, together frequently and so on and so forth. So there is a, there is a, a well-defined statistic for each natural language. And you can use the statistics to figure out what was the substitution that was used for the very simple encryption. So you just look at the most frequent character in, in your cryptogram. And whatever that character is, you say, well, most likely it may represent the letter E. And you work on this assumption by trials and errors, you figure out uh, very quickly, in fact, uh, if you have enough of uh, the material to work on. So this, this statistical analysis that Al-Kindi pioneered, um, long before, mind you, long before we had any good probability theory in place. Um, so that is actually a quite a powerful method that's been used by people breaking ciphers by code breakers over and over again and we use it today in 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 more sophisticated way of course but but you know the essence is actually the same so today um one-to-one -one substitution is not even considered encryption it's just simply say oh we'll, we switch from one alphabet to the other it's very easy to and break this kind of uh, what is called uh, monoalphabetic ciphers, a cipher where there's just one-to-one -one substitution for one character from the alphabet. We just substitute a character. It doesn't even have to be a letter. It could be just anything. Now, of course, you know, this statistical method may not work. So just, you know, for the sake of fun, I included this slide here, which I kind of like because um, it's very difficult um, to write in in a given language, for example, in English or in, in French or German, or uh, without uh, 
uh, following this 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 statistical pattern that some writers take it as a challenge they they really try hard to show that they can master the language to the point where they deviate from this statistic so for example so and there's even a name for this kind of writing they called lipograms um, so this is just um, a piece of text where on purpose you avoid certain symbols and so on and so forth and probably the most famous lipogram ever written is, is a book by Georges Perec by, by the French author uh, who wrote the whole book uh, which is about 85,000 words or so without the letter E and mind you the letter E is also the most common letter in French so the funny thing is that you know, there is an English translation of this book, which you know the translator also avoided the letter E in the whole thing, and there you know and there are other sort of like funny characters who there was a German poet, for example, who hated uh, uh, the letter R, so he wrote like one hundred and thirty poems without using that letter, and he also omitted the letter R from his daily conversation for some number of years, so he probably couldn't even mention his surname over this period of time I guess so you know look up I mean if you are if you are if you can read some languages other Indo-European languages I'm sure you'll find lipograms in your own language uh, be it in Spanish or, or Polish or some non-Indo-European like Finnish and so on and so forth and almost every single can, uh, language produce a number of lipograms so you know obviously alkindi method uh, wouldn't work on lipograms but uh, as it happens uh, those people that communicate secretly are <laughs> not using lipograms either <laughs> right so um and then you know i can continue of course i can give the whole lecture on the history of uh, secure communication it just uh, it's fascinating and you know there's a drama uh, and uh, this uh, that all kind of beautiful cloak and dagger stories can be told about the whole thing but that's 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 not you know that's not the point for the purpose of this presentation uh, so i will just only just summarize by telling you that the, that this quest for a perfect cipher this uh, um, never-ending story of uh, code makers coming with uh, great methods of encryption and code breakers sooner or later coming with yet another wonderful method of breaking those ciphers so this was like a theme in the history of the, of the whole development of secure communication so from skittily that is easy to break from you know to the so-called monoalphabetic ciphers then polyalphabetic ciphers uh, mechanical devices like uh, an electromechanical devices like enigma for example and then further to something that uh, we we call public keys and and then then to quantum crypto and hopefully to even more fancy uh, ways of encryption that i'm just going to mention at the end the device independent method so until recently uh there was this prevailing belief that whenever we come with a, a way to communicate secretly with a a great method of encryption or so sooner or later there will be another clever guy who will uh, come up with uh, equally ingenious way of uh, breaking the cipher so so then then there was this prevailing belief that there's no such a things like a perfect cipher because you know sooner or later someone will just uh, find a, a good attack and that's it that's that's not what uh, we believe today I, I hope most people just uh, agree that um, to some extent quantum cryptography put the end and and gave uh, uh, code makers the upper hand in this game um, so if there is one um, perfect cipher then uh, pretty much everyone agrees that this is this one the one that is called the one-time path so I will use this slide to introduce uh, the key concept that uh, that I'm going then to use um, so I'm going to introduce two characters, um, Alice and Bob. Um, it's just much easier to describe those protocols using the two characters, Alice and Bob. Needless to say, not the real names, of course, the identities are secret. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she 
needs to encrypt it if she wants this message to be um, secret, right? So if she wants to communicate with Bob, uh, she has to take the message and do something to this message. And so I'm showing you here uh, one method of encryption that is known as the one-time path. So you can uh, you can see that uh, on this uh, top um, left uh, corner of the slide that there is a message and written in binary. So you can use ASCII code, whatever. This is actually um, clear to everyone um, what it means. Um, so there's a sequence of zeros and ones, but uh, whatever, a romantic message from Alice to Bob. Now, Alice then, uh, well, first of all, I mean, this, this, by the way, the sequence of zeros and ones in the message has a, a statistical pattern of uh, a natural language. So, um, so there, is, uh, there is a statistical pattern there. Now, Alice is going to wipe out this pattern to make the to, to, to make it so that that each character, each zero and each one appears with the same probability. And the way she does it, she picks up a random sequence of zeros and one. So this is a called cryptographic key and uh, it's in red in my in my slide. So, then when she picks up this uh, completely random uh, sequence of zeros and ones, she adds the message to the key. So that's the encryption process. And this addition is modulo, modulo two. So it works like a regular addition, except that one plus one, as you can see, is equal to zero. But other, th other than that, you know, zero plus zero is zero, and one plus zero is one and zero plus one is one. So it's it's um, binary additional addition modulo two. Now, because the, the key is completely random, the randomness of the key is somehow transferred to the randomness of the crypto cryptogram. So the resulting thing is the cryptogram, the, the thing that has a yellow background. So now uh, Alice then sends over any public channel this cryptogram to Bob. So anyone can actually look at this cryptogram. But, you know, it looks like a random sequence of zeros and one. In fact, it is a random sequence of zeros and one because it was generated by using this cryptographic key. So on the receiving side, we have Bob. Bob receives the cryptogram and then Bob picks up the key, which is identical to the one that Alice used and Bob performs exactly the same operation. So what he does was is, is addition uh, modulo to a binary addition. So he adds the cryptogram to the key and uh, here comes the message that Alice sent. Um, so that works because uh, Bob has exactly the same random key as Alice. And one can show, in fact, uh, the founder of uh, information theory, Claude Shannon, uh, was the one who, who proved that uh, as long as the key is truly random, it, as long as uh, the key is as long as the message is, so it has the same length as uh, the message, and it's never reused, uh, then this is a perfect cipher. You cannot just, there's no way to break it. If you look at the cryptogram, and if you have even, a, no matter how many cryptograms you intercept and analyze them, you will not find anything uh, but just a random sequence of zeros and ones. Now, what is important though, is that you cannot uh, recycle this key. And that, uh, you know, and well, at this point, of course, some of you may ask, and also, okay, fine. So we have the perfect cipher. <laughs> uh, are we done? Why are we not using it? Uh, well, the one time part is a perfect cipher, but, uh, because we have to generate the fresh key every single time we communicate, then there's this issue, what is known as the key distribution problem. So we made this tacit assumption that Alice and Bob are in possession of identical random sequence of zeros and ones. So they had to obtain this sequence somehow, right? Uh, it could be that they met one day in, in, in some secret location and, and agreed on sufficiently long sequences of zeros and ones. And then they traveled 
and they are far away from each other and they started communicating and so they can use this uh, key that they agreed but it is going to be depleted quite soon and then what if they are in two different locations how are they going to establish the new key again so this is known as the key distribution problem so you know that's why i mentioned this is like a holy grail of cryptography solve this problem and you have a perfect cipher so just solve the problem where Alice and Bob being miles and miles away from each other can uh, establish truly random sequence of zeros and one that is identical and that is secret. So, so they know that only the two of them have this and nobody else, because as you can, you can see from this diagram here, the, the secrecy of the key is absolutely important here. Whoever has uh, even a partial knowledge of the key may have a partial knowledge of the message. So here we are, we have the, the key concept, the cryptographic key. And uh, so the obvious question is, how are we going to solve the key distribution problem? What's the status today? So if we have this one-time path as our golden standard that we want to go. By the way, in practice, you know, uh, one-time path has been used uh, and, and is used, but only for very very um, in very special circumstances so it was used when it came to uh, some high level uh, secret communication during the cold war for example between moscow and washington and in some other cases but it's usually not efficient it's just exactly because we, you know we, we have to generate lots of, of that uh, key so um some other systems are used but um but you know we are here now talking about the our platonic perfect cipher so can we get one can we find one um can we fix the problem can we solve the problem of the key distribution so today um, essentially there are two ways of solving this problem one is um, the beautiful mathematical constructions known as the public key systems which is not quite the solution because it's it sort of avoids the key distribution problem uh, and in most cases we can uh, not even prove the security of public key crypto systems they uh, the, the the security is based on the fact that there are certain mathematical problems uh, that are difficult uh, in a sense of computational complexity so we 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 have algorithms for those mathematical problems but as uh, we uh, try to solve um, different instances of, of those problems, the uh, either execution time or the use of memory or, or some physical resource that is needed for computation is growing very rapidly, is growing exponentially. So the, 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 um, but the, the beautiful thing about the public key crypto system is that uh, they avoid the key distribution problem. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into any technical details here. Essentially, the, um, the, every single user of the public key crypto system has two keys. One is public and that is known to everyone and one is private. And uh, so everyone who wants to use uh, public key crypto system generates those two numbers, the public key and the private key. And you never actually reveal the private key, but the public key is known and the public key is used to encrypt messages to you. And um, the, the, the private key is used to decrypt. So there's a certain asymmetry here between encryption and decryption. So it's not the same key. And uh, there are many, very nice and very popular public key crypto system, the most popular being perhaps RSA or elliptic curves. Um, those, um, for example, RSA, as, as, as you, you may know, uh, by the way, the acronym refers to, to the inventors, and that's a reverse Shamir and Edelman, even though, um, so those were American computer scientists and cryptographers who, who came up with this idea, but, uh, in fact, uh, it, they were the, the, the whole idea was also independently discovered by people working for the British uh, um, government communication headquarters. So it's just um, as, as it happened that they were slightly earlier discovered uh, 
by the spooky agencies rather than people working in the academia. Well, um, as it happens, the the those um, most popular public key crypto system like RSA that takes its security from the difficulty of factoring large uh, integers. So if if I um, tell you, you know, factor 15, then you say, oh well, yeah, it's easy. It's three times five, you know, those are the prime factors of 15. But I, if I keep increasing the number of digits, so I go from a two digit number like 15 to something much longer, then it will be increasingly difficult for you to come up with the answer. In fact, exponentially, it will take exponentially more time, not only for you, but for any super duper computer that you may find. So, and that's, that's because we don't have any efficient algorithm for uh, factoring on a classical device. However, and here is you know, the first appearance of quantum. Uh, we do know that you know, you've heard about Shor's algorithm for sure. So that the, there are quantum algorithms that will handle um, and can solve uh, the factoring and therefore can break RSA. You can also break elliptic curves and, and many others. So, so many public key crypto systems are not only not proven to be secure, but also we know that some of them uh, will be vulnerable when we have a quantum computer. So they, they can be broken by a quantum computer. So the big challenge today is to design public key crypto systems that are resistant to quantum attacks. Some people call it post-quantum cryptography. And uh, the National Security Agency in the US had an open call for um, proposals for new generation of quantum resistant public key crypto systems. So, so the idea being that even if you have a quantum computer in place, um, the hope is that uh, those crypto systems will be uh, secure. It's tough, right? Because uh, we don't quite yet understand the whole power of quantum computing. So you may come up with a problem, say you know, there are good candidates like vectors and lattices. And again, okay, not going to go into details, but but do we know for sure that uh, that kind of problem is difficult for quantum computers? Probably not. So, so the public key crypto systems and all crypto systems where you base your security on computational complexity is, um, is the area where there's, uh, the, the security really is, is a bit on the shaky ground, even though uh, those public key crypto systems are very popular, very convenient, and, and beautiful also, mathematically speaking, in many ways. So I'm not going to talk about this. So the other direction, as you can see, is just to fix the problem. So take the one-time path and fix the problem of the, of the key distribution. And uh, here, quantum physics comes to your rescue. So we have quantum cryptography that is addressing this issue. It's kind of fixing the key distribution problem. And uh, historically, there are few ideas. And uh, so um, the, um, the one that was proposed by Charlie Bennett and Gilles Brassard, known as a BB84, that relies on the fact that uh, you cannot, you, on uncertainty principle in a way, so that you cannot. Uh, uh, you encode bits in, in mutually um, unbiased observable. So, so, uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll say, I say a few words about this. Um, that kind of crypto systems are uh, probably, th that, that kind of quantum key distribution uh, is, uh, has some issues. It's, it's mostly related to the fact of the existence of the side channels. Um, so you have to really be sure that you know what you're doing. You have to trust your devices. Um, you have to monitor things at the hardware level. Um, then there is uh, another system which is based on entanglement that, that uh, I proposed back in 91. Um, and uh, that one has uh, the advantage that it can be, <clears throat> it can be sort of, um, well, not redesign, how shall I put it, can be modified to um, to something that is called device-independent crypto, where you don't have to really trust devices that you are using. Uh, and, well, I'll, I'll say a few words about this at the end of, of the talk. 
by the way i'm i'm not uh checking the questions but at some point uh, if you want to maybe i should just stop every now and then and uh, what do you say um what is my chairman telling me shall i stop for a moment and ask for a question or shall i go on I, I, um, so um, we do have a quick question, but it might be a bit ahead of the of the talk. So if you want to, I can I can give you the the question now. But uh, I would rather wait for the right time in the in the slides. As I said, maybe whenever you feel like you can pause for more questions, uh, please do. But at yeah, this time, fine, fine. yeah, fine, fine. So so you know, whenever whenever you can stop me anytime and say yeah, okay. But, there is a popular demand for more knowledge on this or that, and I'm just happy to <laughs> to, to talk. Okay, otherwise okay. I'll continue. I have to say, you know, those those times where you don't see anything but just uh, your screen and you are talking to your screen is really, um, you know, it's it's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, far from ideal, I would say, because I cannot see uh, how people react, and you know. I don't even know whether you find my jokes of any good. Uh, anyway, so let me just continue talking okay. to my screen. Okay, so um, so let's so let me just before we go before we dive in into uh, the, the the quantum part and the, so let me just uh, say a few more words about uh, key distribution problem and uh, just to tell you what people working in classical crypto know and uh, and uh, what they are really expecting when when you say okay solve the key distribution problem what does it mean what what are you supposed to be solving so if, if you are going to use quantum physics so what exactly is needed from quantum physics to solve the key distribution problem so let's start first with uh, maybe an outline what uh, people working in the in the field uh, that the classical cryptographers know so the idea is essentially that um, if we have if Alice and Bob end up with uh, those cryptographic keys and uh, there is so, so imagine that Alice and Bob start key distribution whatever that is maybe they use some it doesn't have to be necessarily quantum but they use a key distribution scheme. So the end result is um, they have uh, two binary strings. Now, they don't they don't uh, have to be identical. Usually they are not because there's a noise in the system and so on and so forth. So there is a need for some sort of public error correction. Uh, so Alice and Bob can do that. Uh, there are techniques which will make those two binary strings identical. Of course, by doing this in public they will reveal some information about the key so then uh, here comes another technique that is used by cryptographers and that is known as the privacy amplification so we assume let's assume that alice and bob did uh, all the error corrections and everything that is needed and they have identical binary strings but um, but an eavesdropper knows something about those binary strings now alice and bob uh, may not know which bits are known and which bits are not known. Uh, but uh, Alice and Bob uh, are aware of the fact that an eavesdropper may have some knowledge. Um, so ideally, of course, you want the probability of Eve, that is an eavesdropper guessing the key correctly, to be close to 1 over 2 to the n, which is you know the probability that you pick up a random key. Um, but uh, in practice, Eve may know much more. So there is a technique that allows Alice and Bob to reduce the size of the key that they have, but make it secure. So somehow there is a way to reduce the amount of information that Eve may have about the key. So the basic idea is, um, can be explained in a very simple term. So imagine, for example, that uh, Alice and Bob uh, 
have a binary string of length two. So there are two bits, call it x1 and x2. And suppose Alice and Bob know uh, that um, Eve knows one bit, but they don't know which one. So they, she may know x1 or she may know x2. But Alice and Bob know that, that she knows not more than one bit, just, just only one bit. Is there a way for Alice and Bob to do something about it? So what Alice and Bob can do is to do the binary addition of the two bits that they have, x1 and x2. So this way, they produce just one bit, z, which is equal to x1 plus x2. And they just simply eliminate any knowledge on each side. So, so, so at this point, um, because if doesn't know one of the two bits, so if she knows x1, she doesn't know x2. So x2 is just a random thing for her. And the addition of something that she knows, x1, to something that is random and she doesn't know, generates something that she doesn't know. So she has just zero knowledge about that. It's just as random as it is. And of course, you know, Alice and Bob know exactly what it is because they know the value of x1 and x2. So, so they simply, in this case, they simply say, okay, well, let's just do the binary addition of uh, x1 and x2. And they do it, look at uh, the result. And, and, and so you can see they just reduce the size of the key from two to one but uh, now they gained in, in terms of security. They have one secret bit. So this kind of privacy amplification, um, well, the, of course, I mean, it's, this is a, just a basic concept, basic idea. And then there is a, a whole protocol which uh, allows you to deal with uh, binary strings as long as you can estimate as long as you know what is uh, Eve's knowledge, so how, what is the probability that Eve can just guess a given key, um, then you will estimate something that is called mean entropy or conditional mean entropy. And, uh, and then you pick up another parameter here, delta, which essentially tells you how, it's kind of a security parameter. Maybe the next slide explains it better. And you can just uh, reduce the key, but you, you make it secure. So roughly when you have the raw key, the first key, uh, after estimating how much Eve really knows about the key, you reduce the size of the key. And that would be the minimal, um, so the green, green sort of uh, bar would be just the, the, the maximum maximal length you can get out of uh, the raw key um, so that, that's what Alice and Bob can get that is considered secure but uh, you can you can also put this uh, well the security parameter if you want to make sure that uh, it is uh, more secure in some statistical sense I'm not going to introduce the statistical distance but 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 you can um, make it even shorter and then make it more secure in in some um, in a sense that it's, it's much more difficult to guess it um, that uh, I guess I guess I'll, I'll just I will not go into mathematical details here but the the thing the the, the, the take-home message from this slide is uh, given binary strings that are identical but are not known but but are known to be not secure alice and bob can use special classical techniques public communication uh, that allows them to reduce the size of the raw key and make it secure so they they, they kind of up to the expectations of course you know if there is too much knowledge on each side then there is a certain critical value of uh, this mean entropy where it's not possible. So that uh, if, uh, so in this case, if, if Eve knows everything, then obviously there's nothing you can do. But, uh, but if there is some uncertainty about uh, on Eve's side, so on, about uh, knowing the key 
given the the knowledge eavesdropper acquired so um so in this case uh, th those techniques can be used the, the crucial thing here is that alice and bob have to find out how much eve knows so that's that's exactly what is required this those techniques do not work unless you really know how much your adversary knows about your secret if uh, that's that's absolutely essential and uh, and there's no classical way of finding out simply no way just uh, mostly because in classical classical domain when you want when you do any eavesdropping that that can be that can be a perfect eavesdropping so that that uh, there is a way to monitor in a very passive way any messages whatsoever so that means uh, classical communication doesn't give you any signature of how much uh, information may have leaked to uh, your adversary but quantum does so you may just ask so what is the intuition why quantum uh, enters here why quantum allows you to um, to to estimate this amount of information that leaked well that that comes from and this is sort of like you know going almost back to the to the to the basics of uh, quantum physics where we we know that we can think about quantum physics as a new kind of probability theory at, the, at least at the very instrumental level and say it's uh, about questioning the Kolmogorov axiom of adding probabilities instead replacing it with uh, another axiom or, or, or set of rules and, 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 and this one is replaced with uh, rule add probability amplitude complex numbers rather than probabilities and then when you do this when you calculate probabilities in this way which is essentially what you know all quantum physics is about is using probability amplitudes in clever way to um, calculate probabilities of, for something to happen and uh, you can convince yourself that if you do things in if you do if you add probability amplitudes to get probabilities you essentially have two components to to your expression you have Kolmogorov part like, like in good classical probability theory where you simply add probabilities if something can happen in two mutually exclusive ways but there is an extra term in, in the if you do it in a quantum mechanical way um, so that may signify that those two mutually exclusive ways are not necessarily perhaps mutually exclusive that's one interpretation whatever no matter how you look at it there is this extra interference term that can either enhance the probability or diminish the probability but that happens you have this quantum interference only when um, nobody is looking which particular alternative uh, took place so if you if you on this diagram you may think about a particle going from um, this point to this point and uh, taking taking two mutually exclusive paths and then you will have quantum interference if nobody there's no entity that is in any way observing so it's a, there's no knowledge which path was taken and you see i'm already start talking about knowledge which path was taken because if there is such an entity if there is an observer or it could be environment observing which particular path was taken then this interference term actually very quickly disappears so that's the origin of decoherence um, it could be environment watching it could be uh, your adversary watching trying to figure out which path was taken which uh, you know paths may correspond to, to um, you may label those paths as one or two or zero or one uh, so clearly watching does make a difference in quantum physics the act of watching will affect the system in 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 a serious way so for example it may just destroy interference and the probabilities for something happen may be completely different than than as compared to the uh, classical domain so in other words you can see that with uh, fully quantum 
interference where there's no entity that knows what happened between input and output, say, uh, then the probability of something is is given by a certain expression. And then if someone acquires knowledge about what happened, the probability changes. And that, that can be detected, that, that can be clearly detected. Now, those of you who know, perhaps uh, are more familiar with uh, the notion of uh, quantum entanglement may just say right away, well, there is a simple solution. Why don't we use quantum entanglement for, for the key distribution? It seems like a super obvious thing to do, right? And indeed, it's, it's, you know, it is a good idea. We can prepare, <clears throat> say, polarized photons or, or, or any other particles in this highly entangled state. Here, I'm just going to use a state uh, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So it could be a state where you have a polarization. 0 could correspond to horizontal, 1 to um, vertical, or whatever. Pick up two orthogonal polarizations. Um, so if we then have a source of such entangled photons, which is represented by this circular thing in the middle, um, you can send one photon to Alice and one photon to Bob, and if they measure the same observable, so they measure in a vertical horizontal basis, or the, if, let's let's use sort of X and Z observable. So if they use Z observable, uh, which is which corresponds to the standard uh, bit measurement uh, zero or one, uh, in this case they will always get uh, correlated perfectly correlated outcomes, right? So either both of them will get zero, so that corresponds to the first element of the superposition, or both of them will get one, which corresponds to the second element of the superposition. And, uh, and that looks like a great idea, except that we have to be pretty sure that um, nobody knows about it. So that, that would work if it is indeed the case that Alice and Bob share truly entang pure entangled state, pure maximally entangled state. And uh, the environment or anything eavesdropper is uh, conveniently factored out from this. So in this case, the secrecy is guaranteed because we see that there's nothing that is entangled and, and you know, being entangled to one of those two terms means that you have some knowledge of those terms. So. So in contrast, you can see this expression on the right. So the red, the red arrow is pointing to that expression, which is, which is the situation we want to avoid. Because in this case, when Alice and Bob perform the measurement in Z basis, for example, they also get identical results. So both of them, both of them will register either zero or one, except that at this, in this case. Uh, any sort of external entity or ex environment or eavesdropper managed to entangle itself with um, uh, with a photon. So it has some knowledge in terms that, that the state is E0 when uh, the, the two bit values are zero and the state of the eavesdropping entity is E1 when the two bit values are one. So um, what shall we do about this? Well, one thing is to for Alice and Bob to test and uh, just to, to make sure that they are really dealing with the case whether they have pure state, which is maximally entangled. They can do it. They can uh, run a statistical test where they distribute, uh, assuming that, uh, that all those particles are prepared always in the same state, they can they can just simply tune themselves to some source of external external source of entangled photons, and uh, they can really check the correlations in the Z and the X basis. So if they find that uh, whenever they choose to measure in the Z basis, they get identical outcomes. And whenever they choose to measure in the X basis, they have identical outcomes. So that, that, I, that, that makes it clear that if they are dealing with qubits, 
if they really understand what's going on, they understand the whole process of the measurement, then it is only this entangled state that can generate such correlations. There's no any state. So those two uh, operators, that tensor Z, so those are the two Pauli operators and X tensor X, um, are the stabilizers for this maximally entangled state. They define the state exactly. So uh, as long as you're dealing with qubits, as long as you know what you're doing, then if you run the statistical test in public and you convince yourself that it is indeed the case uh, that uh, you get identical outcomes all the time, so then, then it's fine. So you, you're dealing with a situation which is in which nothing is entangled to your two photons or two qubits that you're performing the measurement on. And in which case, if really knows nothing, if you start measuring the, the qubit in Z basis and using those outcomes of those measurements to establish a cryptographic key, if will have no knowledge about it simply because there's no entity in, and she's not entangled with the whole thing. However, if, um, if we assume that uh, we want to use uh, Z basis for cryptographic key, uh, then, and this is a public knowledge, and if can entangle itself or entangle a probe or, or something with those two qubits, trying to distinguish whether it's zero, zero or one, one. Now, we assume that those states of the environment or the, the probe that you've prepared, E0 and E1, are not necessarily orthogonal to each other. So I just, I just put the scalar product as cos alpha here. And you can show that if this is the case, uh, then this will show in, in the correlation. So that ZZ will be still perfectly correlated. However, the XX correlations will, and that's, you know, that's a rather simple calculations, will just give you the value of the, the real part of the scalar product. I assume, in fact, that the scalar product is real, is equal to cos alpha. So Alice and Bob at this point, by testing for those correlations, will figure out how much Eve may know, and uh, because uh, they know that if the scalar product of E0, E1 is such and such, uh, then, then they know what is actually the probability that Eve can distinguish between those two non-orthogonal states and therefore figure out correctly what are the values, whether it's 0, 0, or 1, 1, what are the bit values of the key. So, so a simple calculation shows that, that, that you know, using this particular parameterization, that is going to be half 1 plus sine alpha. So as you can see that um, as those states here become more and more orthogonal to each other, so if cos alpha goes to 0, then sine alpha will go to 1, and uh, if will know the bit value with perfect probability in this case. So, uh, but, but you know, this at this point, we do have information now about, uh, we can estimate the, how much Eve knows about the, the bit value. So this is a very simple, I would say, pedagogical example. It's, you can make it, you can refine it, you can make it a little bit more complicated, but the basic idea is that you measure something, and in this case, you, you measure some certain correlations, you run a statistical test on your quantum particles to find out how much Eve may know about the, the, the key. And then you just follow with a classical privacy amplification for the key distribution. So that's uh, how it works. And that's kind of conventional quantum crypto. And there's much more to it because at this point, you know, one would just say, okay, well, that's that's fine. Um, we can do the key distribution this way. Um, is there more? To, is there anything more to it? There is. In fact, uh, I you know I, I mentioned a few times that this works as long as we really know what we are doing, what are the devices doing, we trust those devices and so on and so forth. But most of us, in fact, uh, is not in a, you know, it's, it's not, it's not quite a DIY. It's not like do it yourself. You don't, you don't buy those quantum crypto devices in Ikea and then assemble them at home. So that, that, that would be great, but the, they are slightly more complicated than that. So you don't really know, um, 
how what is inside you have to trust that whoever supplied you with those devices did a good job and um, so you have to just probably trust the provider you have to assume the device comes to you with some sort of certificate which says uh, yeah this is a good and valid device and now the thing is that um, quantum can take us further than that we don't have to make those assumptions and that's that's a beautiful thing so let me just um, now uh, tell you about this uh, new test based on bell's inequality and that gives me maybe some kind of excuse also to present historically how how, how that happened but that's like a natural maybe a, a point where i i'm i'm now going to tell you about the much more um rigid test uh, that uh, will take us into a completely new <coughs> domain of device independent crypto anyway so assuming that there are no urgent questions so i let me just um then tell you a little bit about historical development Hi. yes sorry th there's a couple of questions yes uh good trigger there so the first one um, is a comment by Nadia Belbas uh, saying the jokes are good. <laughs> and Olipo is a nice touch. Yeah. Um, then we have a question from Louis Wal Walterton. Uh, could you discuss exactly why we need to use the min entropy for security analysis instead of any other entropy measure? Uh, for instance, uh, Shannon's entropy, thank you. Yeah, so we we do um yes thank you so the uh, the mean entropy is uh, is used simply because it's uh, it's capturing the worst case scenario not the average case scenario so that the shannon case would be capturing the average case scenario in 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 crypto we are a bit paranoid we want to uh, protect ourselves um, against uh, the worst case scenario so that's that's a very vague answer but that's 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 the major reason why we are using mean entropy. Okay, thank you. I guess uh, if anyone wants to continue asking, they can keep pulling questions and I'll read them if, if they're quick enough. The other question we have or comment from Mark uh, Wainwright is that one of Eve's digit is wrong. Um, and that's on the last slide you had on how to find how much Eve knows. Oh. Um one of eve's egypt is wrong is, digit is wrong yes so maybe she didn't eavesdrop properly on this case yeah, so I, what can i say you know errors can happen it's it's good that if it is on eve's side not if <laughs> the copy, then it's okay but thank you i'll just i'll revisit this slide okay then we have a question from alejandro Kolavit. um how can they distinguish between deviations due to device imperfections and the actual presence of presence of an eavesdropper oh they cannot so again so so thank you for the question so there, there's there's no way to tell so basically all quantum methods uh, can tell us that there was intrusion uh, to the system but uh, usually the quantum itself cannot answer the questions whether the intrusion was due to human interaction with the human intervention or you know, adversarial attack or was it just environment or noise or imperfection in the devices so what you do you take the worst case scenario you assume that anything that you observe as noise is the result of adversarial action so that's again you know the paranoid approach to um to this field so you simply just take the worst case scenario and you just um yeah okay thank you and the last question which i think you're going to answer in your following slides um is from adam Luca. can you recommend any self-contained sources that discuss complete security proof for a concrete qkd protocol in as much detail and rigor as possible yes um actually yes uh, so perhaps um Two friends and colleagues of mine, um, Thomas Vidik and Stephanie Werner, uh, have um, a wonderful set of lectures. They are now recorded on, on and somewhere on YouTube, um, and uh, they do explain um, with a reasonable level of uh, well. Uh, procedure well with 
it is much more sort of uh, with a reasonable level of mathematical sophistication, I would say. So you, you have all the necessary concepts introduced and uh, all I will, I, what I can do, I can certainly um, uh, perhaps provide uh, links which you guys can put on the website and uh, to okay. all the additional resources. So for those of you who want to go deeper into this, um, then then yeah, there, there are a few things I would recommend. But certainly, when it comes for a good, solid, uh, beautifully done overview, then I think Stephanie Vern and Toma Vidik nailed it down. I think that would be my my first suggestion. But maybe there will be a few other that I, I can also come up with. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think these are the, all the questions we have for now. So OK. Thank you. So let me just carry on then. So, um, so yeah, so the um, the quantum crypto, the, um, the, the, the story of quantum crypto is, um, you know, chronologically speaking, the idea of using quantum phenomena for uh, hiding and encrypting messages is, is due to Stephen Wiesner, who wanted actually to use the whole thing for producing uh, banknotes that you cannot forge. Um, Steven Wiesner is, is he's a very interesting person. Um, he, he, was, he's, he tried his ideas, but nobody was interested except Charlie Bennett, who knew Wiesner pretty well. And uh, so Charlie listened and, and, uh, and then uh, Together with uh, Gilles Brassard, they realized that um, the, some of the Wiesner's idea may actually be better used for the process of, of key distribution. So then they, uh, they uh, came up with this idea and uh, that was presented at one of the conferences uh, in India back in, in the 80s. So that was like the American path to, to uh, quantum crypto. So Steven Wiesner is, uh, was at the time based in the US, but I think since then he moved to Israel. Uh, and uh, I don't think he's doing any physics anymore, but he's interested in all kinds of things. The last time I talked to him, he was interested in solar energy. So I mean, it's amazing, uh, you know, <laughs> this field attracts amazing characters and, and Steven Wiesner certainly is one of them. Now, um, it was, when Charlie, Charlie and Gilles published this uh, um, this idea in those conference proceedings, uh, rather obscure conference proceedings, that uh, uh, at the time, you know, that was long before internet archives, you know, whatnot, uh, was just not known to the community. It was certainly not known to me, and um, so my idea came up. Um, I came up with this idea of using entanglement or using bell inequalities for the purpose of the key distribution somewhat independently. I just learned about uh, the ideas of Charlie and Jill only later, which actually resulted in publishing this joint paper <laughs> for Scientific American that was mentioned by Paul. Uh, or, uh, so yeah, so it was actually kind of fun uh, to discover, well, you know, it's 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 fun and not fun. I mean, it's when when you have this idea, um, you're a bit disappointed that someone else thought about it. But also, when you when I had this idea, I wasn't quite sure whether this is of any value actually. So, in a way, I was happy that there are some big guys who thought uh, about this idea in a completely different way. But uh, but that gave me some kind of confidence that I <clears throat> I'm perhaps not doing complete nonsense by, by thinking about those uh, um, key distribution using entangled photons. But anyway, so, so the entangled-based quantum crypto, and using in particular using uh, as a statistical test, not the test that I just described by test based on CHSH inequalities, which is much more rigid, led to the new ideas, to um, uh, especially to device independent crypto. Um, that that was proposed by a number of other people, uh, Tony Yassin, uh, Valerio Scarani, and uh, Stefano Pironia, and so on and so forth. So, well, th th a number of people then build it up on this this initial idea and and push uh, the the field uh, further. So, we'll 
we'll talk about those uh, in a moment. Um, in a sense, you know, I would say that when it comes to quantum crypto, the way I thought about it, that could have been discovered years, years, years back. Um, but nobody actually connected the dots. So, so it was people were talking, people who, who, who worked in the foundations of quantum physics were interested in the philosophical ideas about uh, uh, the fact, uh, you know, how, how really quantum physics works, because it, it is uh, not entirely obvious how, what is the inner working if, uh, if you just, you know, in the early days, certainly, or even today, as you know, there's lots of discussion what it means, how it works, how should we look at it, there are different interpretations. But uh, <clears throat> but for me, the, <clears throat> the, the for me, like this Eureka moment came <clears throat> when I was uh, reading a paper that Einstein wrote with Podolsky and Rosen, and uh, that was back in 1935. And Einstein was unhappy about the completeness of, uh, of uh, quantum theory, about uh, whether this description is really complete. And, uh, and then he comes up with uh, some interesting experiments. Uh, he talks about uh, the elements of physical reality, something like properties that do exist. And then they define, he, you know, the, the, the Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen define this element of reality by saying that if without in any way, so this is this in this yellow box that you can see, and it just reads, if without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty uh, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. Now, <clears throat> if you read it as a physicist, you read it as a physicist. But if you read it as a cryptologist, then you say, ooh, this is like a perfect eavesdropping, right? This is a definition of a perfect eavesdropping. And uh, so that it was, you know, this moment for me, I say, oh, wait a minute, but, you know, um, I do know that, uh, so the, the eavesdropper, well, exactly what the eavesdropper would like to do is to find this element of physical reality, because information is physical, is always encoded with some physical properties. So, um, so then um, if you can design a system where there is no element of physical reality, then there will be no eavesdropping. And, and um, so I, I just took this definition of physical element of physical reality, the definition of eavesdropping, and, and that was my sort of uh, inspiration just to, to, because, you know, I knew that later on John Bell and others came up with uh, statistical tests and, and there were some experiments and so on and so forth. But it was this one crucial sentence in, in the paper, in the EPR paper, as it is known today, um, that uh, put me on a track thinking about it. So the idea, you know, I'm quite often when I give popular talks, I try to um, explain it uh, by saying that, you know, take a polarization, for example, it's an intrinsic property of a photon. You can not just measure polarization per se, but you can measure polarization with respect to some specific direction. So you specify the type of the polarization so you can measure it. You send a photon to a device, at least, you know, in this simplistic way, you can say that in any measurement, we can get only two results for polarization, plus one or minus one in, in some units of, uh, say, h-bar, right? Now, the question, of course, is um, do photons have predetermined values of any polarization whatsoever? Do they carry those values with them? So that was essentially the question that Einstein was asking. Not in this way, but uh, but that was the question. And uh, Einstein need that you know had this sort of thing that um, well there is an issue with the with the with the existence of the element of uh, reality in in some circum in some situations, and then um, then John Bell in so we are moving from 1930 to 1964, so it's like 30 years later, John Bell comes along and says, yeah, you know, it's actually not uh, such a philosophical uh, thing. You can, it is actually a testable proposition, those elements of uh, physical reality. And he comes up with those, uh, what is known today as the Bell inequality. And uh, the Bell inequalities in, uh, 
in a in a in a version that was were proposed by um, Clauser, Horn, Holt, and Shimon is is known as CHSH. Inequality uh, goes roughly. You know, if I were to give a one slide intro to Bell inequalities, that would be it. So you have those two guys, two um, physicists, or two people who want to communicate, Alice and Bob. They have uh, detectors where they can. Each of them can measure two different types of polarization. So call it A1 and A2 on the Alice side and B1 and B2 on Bob's side. So you assume now that uh, A1 corresponds to a given type of polarization and therefore it has two different values. Either it can have two different values, either plus one or minus one. The same for A2, same for B1, same for B2. So if those are really uh, binary random variables, so th those values are there attributed to uh, those types of polarization. So then you can easily construct another random variable S. And so you can see the expression for S. It's uh, And you can see that as long as uh, B1, B2 are equal to either plus one or minus one, so for in each particular instance where um, the measurement happens, where they obtain those uh, entangled particles, for example, or particles that uh, those photons on which polarization they are going to measure. If in each every single run there there are those numerical values there, then you can see that um, one of those terms, either b1 plus b2 or b minus b1 minus b2 is equal to zero, and the other is equal to plus or minus two, right? <laughs> so if um, b1 b2 are identical, then B1 minus B2 is equal to zero. And if they are not identical, <coughs> then uh, B1 plus B2 is equal to zero. Anyway, so that, that's easy, easy to see that uh, this variable, the new random variable S can only uh, be equal to plus two or minus two. There's just two numerical, two possible numerical values. So then if you run this experiment many, many times, and sometimes you get uh, plus two, sometimes you get minus two, you look at the average value. So it has to be somewhere in between those two, right? So somewhere between minus two and two. And that is what it's known as CHSH inequality. So for any um, experiments where there exist, uh, each property has a well-defined numerical value, uh, you expect uh, this um, figure of merit S to be in between minus two and two. So if, if there is an element of physical reality attributed to every single uh, type of polarization, then, then this thing is satisfied. Except that uh, this kind of view, the local rules, can be refuted. And uh, we know that uh, it was, in fact, refuted um, in many experiments, like I'm not going to go into details, but you know, there, there were many experiments. At the very beginning, in fact, when people started experimenting with the Bell inequality, and it was not the case also that in, in, in the 60s where John Bell came up with an idea that oh, you know, all experimentalists jumped up on this because they had nothing else to do. In fact, um, the very few uh, were interested in that kind of thing, even though it seems to be like one of the most fundamental questions one can ask in physics, right? So for many of us, the most remarkable and the most convincing experiment was the one that was uh, carried out by Alain Aspe and his team in Institut d'Optique in Orsay, in Paris, in the 80s. So after, after Aspe, most physicists, first of all, physicists are like woke up and said, okay, well, that's something interesting there, because what does it really mean? And then, you know, the whole shebang of papers and discussions and everything started so again. I'm not going to go into philosophy of this, but <clears throat> from the crypto point of view, all it means that photons do not carry, so there are situations where photons do not carry predetermined values of polarization because those Bell inequalities can be violated. And if the values didn't exist prior to measurements, they were not available to anyone, including eavesdroppers. So testing for the violation of Bell inequalities is in a way testing for eavesdropping. So instead, so, so the statistical test, test for the Bell inequalities um, can be used 
as a test for eavesdropping because eavesdropper would touch, would just try to learn what is the value of polarization and would introduce this element of physical reality. So that's not necessarily the way we think about this today, but, but you know, that was the way at least I was thinking. So sometimes the way you, 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 you discover something is a little bit convoluted. It's, it's not as simple. So, uh, so Bell inequalities, more or less what I described before, you take untangled states, uh, you run statistical tests, except that this times we are not testing for X, X and Z, Z correlations, but we are testing for the whole, we, we choose a set of correlations, which uh, guarantee the, which has a, sorry, uh, we choose a set of polarization of set of observables on qubits that, that uh, guarantee the maximal violation and uh, and we, we take it from there. So it all, when, when it sort of, and here I just bring the Bristol theme into this because uh, uh, the, the first experiments of this idea <clears throat> that uh, took place in Malvern in, in something that at the time it in the institution that at the time was called DRA, Defense Research Agency. And uh, those two colleagues of mine, you may recognize John Rarity, he's now in Bristol, and his colleague Paul Tapster. So I, you know, I ended up knowing John because we attended a conference somewhere in Cortina d'Ampezzo and ended up skiing on the slopes and uh, taking lifts together and talking physics. So obviously we are not attending some of the sessions, but um, but that was more, much more productive because John was one of those uh, very few people who got interested in that kind of stuff. He said, you know, that's cool. Uh, let's let's do experiments. So we talk and talk and talk, and then I just uh, visited them in Melbourne, and that resulted in, uh, in in a nice collaboration that lasted for a while. So we 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 I say we actually it was John and Paul who um, implemented just, it was just a proof of principle that those things uh, actually work uh, using uh, parametric down conversion and and, uh, and they use uh, statistical tests based on CHSH inequalities and essentially show that, that this is actually not entirely science fiction, even though, you know, this work was done um, soon after, it was in 1992 or so. But, um, and then there was just uh, zillions of anecdotes when, um, DRA was under Ministry of Defense and John and Paul were not supposed to be doing anything related to crypto. Crypto is uh, in the UK is under foreign office and that's, that are those guys in Cheltenham, right? So, so they are supposed to be doing. So it took John a while to persuade uh, the, his superiors that uh, actually, you know, that kind of crypto may, may, may not be um, something that people who are trained in mathematics uh, that can appreciate and do right away. Well, another thing was, of course, in this, is to make sure that this stays in public domain is, is not entirely classified. And this paper in Scientific American that I wrote with Charlie and Jill was good because John could take this paper again to his superiors and say, look, come on, don't be silly. You know, the whole idea is in public domain. <laughs> Let us publish all those results. Um, because, and you know, th they also had to persuade the management that this is actually a valuable piece of research because as John or Paul put it, you know, if I don't take a laser and aim it at a tank, I'm not doing research as far as my bureaucratic uh, colleagues are concerned. So um, yeah, there were, you know, humorous moments and many more, but, uh, but a lovely period of time. And I was actually, um, very privileged, I, I thought, uh, to meet uh, such fantastic experimentalists uh, uh, who were so different. You know, Paul was uh, completely dedicated to his lab and his bridge club. Um, John uh, was dedicated to his lab, but he also traveled the world and was like uh, telling people about all exciting experiments that um, they were doing in the lab. Anyway, so that was um, that was the first sort of experimental test of uh, those ideas um, that uh, I was playing with. So you know, of course, you know, there's a bit uh, the way I present it. Uh, it's uh, it's just very perhaps simplistic. It gives you the idea. It doesn't give you so all the tools that you need to 
be more specific. So, for example, you have to just estimate the secret key rate, how much key you can generate given such and such violation of CHSH uh, inequalities. So that was done. And um, then uh, let me come to, so, so and so that, that kind of things are known to work uh, with CHSH inequalities or so. Uh, with the assumptions that uh, that I've been sort of repeating, that Alice and Bob know what they are doing, they have control and complete trust in the devices, most likely they just constructed those devices themselves, and uh, there's even just more subtle assumptions that somehow they have free will because all those statistical tests involved um, require that you make random choices uh, choosing between, say, A1, A2, B1, and B2. And uh, it's, of course, it's not done by Alice and Bob. There's a random number generator that does the job. Um, so it's um, perhaps a, a bit too much to phrase it in terms of a free will. But 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 you know, in some sense, uh, one can one can, if you want, you can push uh, the boundaries of crypto in that direction. But again, I'm not going to talk about this. Now, the the thing that I mentioned to you is that if you, however, don't have a trust in your devices, so suppose you, you purchase your devices, and um, then one can one can show that this uh, test based on uh, checking for x x z z correlations is actually not good enough. So devices can be pre-programmed to satisfy the conditions of this uh, x x z z test. And uh, nonetheless, uh, the the values of the of the key bits will be perfectly known to um, an eavesdropper, whoever designed those devices or pre-programmed those devices. Um, so, so this um, in this case, you yeah, one can one can construct a simple case where uh, you so this diagram on the bottom right is uh, illustrates a way you can do it so for example devices can be presented with uh, read up tables so when alice sets up uh, the measurement to x a value is read from the x column the left column and if alice wants to measure z the, those the value is read from another memory allocations and you can prepare those two devices in such a way that if they measure the same observable those outcomes are always identical and if they measure a different one then there's no correlation so that can be done and uh, but that of course assumes that the, the devices were really um, tempered and prepared in such a way that you are fooled as a, as a legitimate user can we go around it well it turns out that uh, the statistical test that is based on the Bell inequalities is rigid. And uh, that was actually, you know, I wish I I could say that I figured this out, uh, but I didn't. I, I it, It's actually quite a good illustration of the fact that sometimes your ideas are more clever than you are. Um, because uh, it took only, you know, the, the same kind of system, but uh, it was... Uh, Tony Yassin, Nicola Bruno, Nicola Gisele, Serge Massara, and Stefano Pironi, and Valerio Scarani, who, <clears throat> uh, who, who realized that you don't have to, you can use the, the fact that uh, the, the CHSH test is rigid. It means that if you see the violation of the Bell inequality at the max, there's no other way to get it. There's no way to pre-program devices. It has to be done essentially on qubits it has to be really the case there's no there's no other physics there's no other scenario that it will give you this and that uh, led to um the concept of using chsh inequality where you don't have to trust the devices of course you know it just is a question that uh, um, if devices have a built-in transmitter that transmits all the key values so uh, that's not necessarily what you want um the device independent scenario may be also maybe maybe useful not necessarily in the situations where you purchase your devices from someone whom you don't trust or your enemy but it's something that may actually protect you from your misunderstanding or, or, or errors in your in experimental design sometimes when you design things 
uh, you can make stupid errors that can be then exploited. So that would be like a hardware errors where someone can figure out later on that by doing it this way, it just leaks information. So for example, Charlie Bennett was telling me when, when they set up the first uh, experiment on the site, the, 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 the best way to intercept was actually to listen very carefully to a device that was choosing the type of the polarization because it produced different noise depending whether it was rotating this way or rotating the other way. So Charlie was then telling me that that device was um, completely secure as long as your eavesdropper was completely deaf. So you see, um, the, the, there are some imperfections which we cannot avoid. Sometimes we go, or we, sometimes we are not even aware about uh, those imperfections. So then this device independent thing is good because it says, well, you know, you can screw it up a little bit, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you achieve this uh, violation of bell inequalities that that works because that's what matters at the end device is not so independent hardware is not so independent it is actually the the correlations per se so now the the um the analysis of security of the device independent was uh, slightly less trivial than because you have to relax some assumptions and so on and so forth and you have to make some assumptions so originally that was with the assumptions that each uh, run is independent from each other and so on and so forth um, but uh, so as you see the key rate is is a bit lower as compared to the not device independent scenario but there was a big uh, thing still to prove that uh, it all works where you don't necessarily assume that uh, each run is independent and identically distributed from each other so that was uh, that that kind of assumption was almost defeating the whole concept of of the device independent crypto because uh, all we really wanted was uh, that any device you know that that, that 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 we didn't want to make any assumptions about uh, the, the Hi. yes sorry there's there's two questions that might be related to uh, what you just said um first one is from uh, Raman Chandre how does violation of CHSH imply no eavesdropper well so um I hope that um, so that that okay so the the two ways I can answer the level of of my presentation so far to be consistent with what I said so the first one is you can think about CHSH as a different statistical test. I described the easiest statistical test at the very beginning where you were looking at correlations XX and ZZ. So that statistical test was good enough as long as you know that you are dealing with qubits and then, so hopefully that was clear. Now with CHSH, it is similar to, to that one, except that you don't measure XX and ZZ. You measure also a few more observables. You, 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 it's a little bit more sophisticated test. And that one um, is, uh, implies the security in a stronger sense, in a sense that when you see the violation for that test, uh, it's rigid in a sense that, uh, as I said, it's, it's, you know, it can only be achieved by, by entang maximally entangled qubits. So, so that, you know, is not, of course, uh, completely maybe clear right away because I didn't derive it. I tried more sort of phenomenological approach by showing to you that CHS, violation of CHSH inequality implies that you cannot assign numerical values into certain observable. And then saying, if, you, if this is the case, if you see that there's no value assignment, there's nothing to eavesdrop in this sense, those values do not exist. So that's another way of looking at it. But of course, you, if you want to um, do all the mathematics, in, in particular showing that the test is rigid, is not entirely trivial. So you just have to, um, so again, in those um, references that I'm going to provide, uh, you will probably find the answer there. Um, there is a follow-up from the same uh, person. Uh, I mean, what if the eavesdropper entangles their system, then ours, uh, 
and still we see the violation? Well, the, the, the depends on the degree of entanglement. So there is a trade-off between the degree of, so even eavesdropper entangles itself with those um, two, say, photons that Alice and Bob are going to measure. Then uh, the, at some level of entanglement, you don't see the violation of the Bell inequalities. So, I mean, the entanglement, let's be careful here because we are talking about a few types of entanglement here. So one is the entanglement between the two qubits that you use for the violation of the CHSH inequality. We would like them to be as entangled as possible. Now, what I understand what the, uh, the question is, okay, now you want to entangle yourself with those two entangled qubits. So, and that kind of entanglement is then used for, for eavesdropping. Uh, and that's that's true. That's that's how um, you analyze uh, the eavesdropping strategies. But the thing is that the more entanglement is there between those two qubits and the probe that is provided by by, by an eavesdropper, then, then then you see less and less the violation of Bell inequality. And at some point, the Bell inequality is not violated. And at which point, you know that you cannot establish the qubit. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then we have, actually, we have a couple of new questions now. Uh, first, a question and a follow-up from Erika Anderson. In device-independent crypto, do you not still have to trust that you, uh, that you are choosing the measurements, free will? And the follow-up is, uh, what if you buy a self-contained device-independent QKD system that also chooses the measurement directions for you? Or yeah, should you buy a random number generator from different supplier? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I was coming to this. So if if, uh, if you allow me then, Erika, to um, continue because I'm going to answer a very good question. Yeah, so. um, there's there's another one. Um, maybe maybe you want to answer this one first. Um, this is from Lewis Walterton. Uh, could you comment on the importance of more general non-signaling theories that go beyond quantum in cryptography? What happens if the distribution we observe during the DIQKD protocol is not classical or quantum, but more general non-signaling? Well, you know, if this happens, then that would be a, a, a real breakthrough. In, so forget about quantum crypto. You get the Nobel Prize for observing such correlations. You know, those non-signaling correlations are interesting. I mean, we, <clears throat> we, they, they are kind of uh, interesting to look at simply because uh, they do not allow you for any instantaneous signaling. So they, they kind of, you know, they look possible from, from um, a common sense sort of approach. It's a good question why we, so using this sort of type of the CHSH inequality that I presented, uh, uh, the the classical range is from say zero to two between two and two square root of two you have a quantum range and then if you assume non-signaling correlations you can go all the way to four now the good question of course is why quantum physics is sort of um, stopping at two square root of two why it doesn't go any further um, so that entering what we now call non-signaling, but not quantum correlations. Actually, nobody knows. So it would be good to, that there are a few papers where people are trying to justify what would happen if you go further. Uh, maybe communicational complexity would be trivial. Maybe this, maybe that. But I don't think we have any convincing answer at this point. So I, I um, so if you, we know that, you know, if you have correlations in that domain, quantum crypto would work, or, or whatever crypto would work. You may not call it quantum anymore, but uh, because that kind of correlations will also have properties that the stronger, that the, if you see the violation at the higher level, you just exclude um, the eavesdrop. And it has been proven. People analyze non-signaling correlations. And many, many things actually can be easier to prove if you don't restrict yourself to quantum domain, but operate in non-signaling things, because the, the shape of non-signaling correlations is somehow in the parameter space is, is easier to perhaps look at and analyze. So um, so to, the, to, to be short in the answers, uh, well, yeah, we wish. I mean, if you, if you can come up with any non-signaling correlations, though, then, then it's absolutely 
fantastic uh, that, that, that are not quantum. You are entering, uh, you are discovering something new. And the answer to the question is why, why there is this so-called serial sum bound, but two square root of two? Why, why, the, why quantum physics stops there? Just, nobody knows. Within quantum physics, within the current formulas, we, we have a statement that we cannot get more. But uh, in terms of understanding, why is that so? What would happen if we had correlations that go a little beyond two square root of two? Two square root of two plus epsilon. What would be that? And we don't know. It just would be nice to, to, to be able to answer this question in the following way. You know, if you were to go beyond two square root of two, this would happen and that's not physical. But, but we don't have a statement like this. Okay, thank you. I think that's that's all the questions for now. So, thank okay. You. So then, just will lead me into the um, um, the final thing. So, so right now we just assume that uh, modulo what uh, Erica mentioned the question of uh, where the random number generators come from. Assuming that you can make all those random choices of your observables and so on and so forth, um, the we have now a decent proof that uh, device independent works. And in fact, it's actually very nice because uh, the proof of the most complex scenario is in fact reducing this most complex scenario modulo some overhead to uh, the IID case uh, that uh, Pironia and others analyze. So this, this plot that I showed you is actually okay so you can show that uh, you don't have to be more sophisticated i mean you get the pretty much the same key rate which is promising for experimental realization so that was uh, that was work of thomas vidik and uh, rotem Arn friedman and renato rena so, so now uh, coming back to the final point and that was uh, the topic of the question. So now with this device independent scenario, it is actually very important that uh, your free will is exercised. So that means that your random number generators are yours and you trust them. You don't get them from the same provider. You don't get like a nice self-contained thing and the guy comes to you and you don't trust the guy and says, you know, here is your key distributing device and by the way you can as a bonus i gave you for free random number generators and <laughs> that's a big no 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 it's just simply um it, there's no way we can this this we are entering the super deterministic scenario if we know in advance so if those random number generators are tempered they just simply generate numbers that generate uh, values which are predetermined which are somewhere in this in those devices so that your adversary knows about it so you know what will be measured in advance and you can then prepare your key distributing devices to and to register whatever you know, should be registered so by from the eve's perspective so that's um, that's a good point so when uh, so certainly you have to separate your choices from um, from uh, from the, the devices so the choices should be random in in a strong sense and uh, so so yes um, we need this free will we need uh, independent random number generators that we constructed ourselves or we trust them and um, otherwise the, the the whole thing doesn't work so there is of course and now we can go a little bit further i'm not going to do that and talk about randomness amplification how much of this randomness do you really need if you have device that is trusted but not quite can you do something about it so yes you can play with that but let's let's agree at this point that that we need a little bit of a free will or a little bit of true genuine randomness on alice and bob's side for the whole thing to work um so that was uh, that was actually a slide that was anticipated by uh, the person who asked the question about those devices. So now let me just um, let me just perhaps then conclude that uh, one can one can talk a little bit about all kind of things, but let me just conclude that uh, it's on the experimental side. It's it's um, 
we don't have device independent, uh, truly device independent quantum crypto yet, but uh, all kinds of cryptographic protocols are being explored all over the, all over the world, be it on the land using optical fibers, but also in the space. So actually this picture shows uh, an attempt to launch a satellite to the orbit uh, and the rocket exploded uh, during the, the launch and uh, the, a little device that was supposed to there was a nano satellite as a, one of the payloads on this on this um, on this rocket was a, a satellite from Singapore where um, our colleagues wanted to see whether the source of entangled photons would actually generate proper entanglement in space. You know, there are all kinds of experimental considerations you have to take into account. So that was a kind of a disaster, spectacular disaster. The, the rocket exploded. And, uh, but then when they collected all the debris later on, so a few months later, they brought the satellite to the lab and it was still working. So it was amazing that it just, you know, survived this explosion. But, you know, explosions aside, they gave good publicity to, to the Singapore team. Um, so, you know, sometimes if things go wrong, it's not necessarily that bad from a longer term perspective. Um, the, but, you know, today, certainly the leaders in, in satellite uh, quantum communications are the, the Chinese. Uh, they have a dedicated satellite called Mishu satellite uh, that can distribute uh, entangled photons into two ground stations, which are like a thousand kilometers apart from each other. Um, so uh, if you want to learn a little bit more, perhaps then I can suggest um, uh, there's a sort of a semi-popular review uh, that I wrote with Renata Rene on the, 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 the frontiers of quantum crypto. But uh, as I said, I will also just provide some other online references in, in the, so that you can actually get them from the web or somewhere. And just to conclude, you know, for me, it is actually interesting. As you said, it was 30 years of, uh, when I started working on quantum crypto. It was part of, it was, was back when I was in student in Oxford, and I do feel like a dinosaur. And I never actually honestly thought that I would actually see this. I thought it was more just like a science fiction you know, a thing that you have to invent in order to write your thesis and get your PhD, and then you just get on and do something else in life, something much more practical. But here I am, you know, still in a way doing quantum crypto because uh, quite recently I was you know, involved uh, a little bit in, in this experimental work of the Chinese colleagues where they used uh, the key distribution from the Mishu satellite over those distances over a thousand kilometers which uh, which was nice to see you know my ideas sort of being almost 30 years old and uh, being implemented on the scale so you know one never knows so my message to all of you guys uh, if you're working on your phd just don't uh, don't you know take it more seriously perhaps one day uh, you know if you have some wacky ideas who knows one day that 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 idea may even be realized so thank you for your attention Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very inspiring talk, and especially a final note for the students. I think that's that's encouraging. Uh, even if you have to wait a few years, you know there's a chance for those ideas to to be put into practice. Um, at this point, uh, I think we have one follow-up question. Uh, but if there are more questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, this is again from Eric Anderson uh, to further follow up on the free will issue. It seems tricky to guarantee that the DVI-QKD system actually then uses the input from your separate random number generator. Um, I don't know. It's just, um, I guess, if, if you know, uh, in a sense that uh, that 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 is a, a certainly good point. So so you can um, if it is if you if you have zero knowledge about the device, and you are plugging in an external thing that you trust, um, to what extent then you know that um, um, you are using the. Well, I think you know that the one that you. Yes, I, I, I think you can overcome this objection. So what you can do is, is uh, yeah, for the, 
for the statistical test, you certainly see the recorded data from the genuine random number generator, whether the device is using it or not using it. So that's 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 a separate story. We can actually separate those things. So, so yeah, I think we can overcome this objection by um, in the in the device independent scenario. We we don't trust device entirely. So what device is doing and what kind of whether it just obeys this input or not is is irrelevant at this point. So the the we just do the statistics on the basis of data that is shown by the random number generator that we trust. So when the random number generator says now it's A1, in our statistical analysis, we assume it was A1. Whether it was A1 or A2 it's, or something else, it's, it's not so important because that will just show up in the test later. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions. First from uh, Ryan Mann. Thank you very much for a great tutorial. Uh, I'd be interested to know what you consider the most important open problem in the theory of quantum cryptography. Well, there are, there are many um, interesting. Uh, so the quantum crypto is not only about the key distribution. So the one I was just uh, telling you about is, is the key distribution thing. But uh, there are many interesting protocols that go beyond the key distribution. And I think a big challenge for the community is to find more. The, the reason quantum crypto is not competing with public key crypto system is because um, in, in public key crypto systems, we have digital signatures. We have, uh, you, can use, you can use public key to protect passwords and so on and so forth. Um, where the quantum crypto is restricted to point-to-point -point communication, but also to um, perhaps some interesting protocols like a blind quantum computation where you, for example, I didn't talk about it, but that's a, a, that's a great area, in fact, uh, where many things, beautiful things are happening. It's, it's related to the fact uh, whether you can give a, suppose you have a quantum computer and you want to uh, present data to this quantum computer to to run computation, but you there are some security restrictions. So for example, you would like uh, this computer to perform these computations blindly without looking at your data, or you would like, um, you don't want to reveal certain things. So, so there, are, there are zillions of quantum protocols, which uh, or, or cryptographic protocols that wait for good uh, quantum version. We know that some of them in some extremes uh, like quantum bit commitment and the like may not be in, may not work but but the question is you know there's always a way of rest, relaxing certain restrictions and, and 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 doing something so i would say that um quantum crypto in terms of um uh not point to point but going beyond point to point communication and looking at some secure quantum computation aspects is is a great challenge Another challenge, of course, is to find good um, quantum-resistant public key crypto system, which is essentially what uh, NSA is trying to do. Um, so yeah, there are many challenges, but but those were probably going beyond point to point and exploring and adopting to quantum many other cryptographic protocols that would be one and uh, coming up with a good post-quantum crypto that would be another one. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, just a quick comment from Mark Wainwright. Uh, wonderful talk, thanks, from an interested non-physicist. I believe in the audience we have quite a broad range of uh, people from academia and not academia. If I remember the statistics uh, I saw recently, it's a few hundred people uh, that have registered for the conference. So uh, in that sense, thank you very much for those that attended the, the, the session today. I think that there are no more questions at this point. Um, so uh, if that if that is okay, unless you have any anything else to say. Uh, um, not really. Just thank you very much for having me, and um, and uh, you know have a have a good and uh, day. I'm pretty sure that uh, you will have interesting sequence of talks and tutorials later today. Okay, thank you very much. It's been it's been a, a pleasure. It's been a wonderful talk. Uh, I think inspiring for for many. Uh, thank you again. And a general message for.
uh, those um, following here. Uh, we're going to uh, follow the agenda, and that means that in half an hour, we're going to be meeting at uh, Gata Town. Uh, that's under the underlying platform. Uh, you're all welcome to join. Uh, the next session is going to be, as you can see at the banner down here, at half one uh, pretty sometime. That is in <laughs> in about two, two and a half hours. Um, and with that, I'm happy to encourage everyone to join this networking. Uh, remind everyone, please, your full name where, uh, wherever possible. And that is going to make interactions easier. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. And see you later.